So this uh, live stream is number eight, and uh, it's all about types of honeybees, the pros and cons. And if this is your first time here, I'm Doug the Bee Guy, and this channel is all about uh, making you become a better beekeeper. So welcome to the live stream. Um, like I said, this is number eight. So if you haven't checked out some of the other ones, we have produced a lot of content in the last few months and uh, had some great comments about it. So hopefully it's helping you out in your beekeeping endeavors or if you're just here to learn something about honeybees, that's fantastic too. Um, like and subscribe to the channel if you're interested. If you're getting value out of it, that would be fantastic if you want to be a better beekeeper. And don't forget to click on the bell notification so that you get notified when we do these live streams or new videos or anything else that we put up on the channel. I did put up a uh, in the community tab. It's kind of new. Um, I put up a poll to see what uh, what next video you guys would like to see. So if you uh, if you vote on that, because I'm gonna kind of close it up in the next week or two and then put that video up. So check it out. See what. Uh, What's going on? Thank you, Eve. I always forget to switch this thing. This is fancy software, and I'm always just playing with it, and it's, uh, I always forget to change the slide. So thanks for doing that. Um, if I do that again, please let me know, because I am I do have a lot of slides to go through, and I don't want to do that. That's silly. All right, so types of bees. We're going to kind of cover types of bees that you can uh, easily get in North America. If you're from another part of the world, there are other kinds of bees, but these are the most popular honey bees that you can get in this part of the world. Um, interesting fact, there are like 23,000 kinds of bees in the world, and only six types make honey. So that's amazing. It's definitely a gift from God making honey. Very few bees actually do that. So let's just start with the uh, types of bees. Um, we have Italians, which are the most popular um, bees in the probably in the world as far as uh, making honey and kind of uh, using them as livestock, which is what beekeepers do, and producing honey and bees. Italians are probably the most prolific. Then you have carniolans, which are probably the second uh, most used bee. A cordovan I put in here, it's not really a, a different type, it's really a subspecies of Italians, but I put them in here because I really enjoyed uh, having them um, probably four or five years ago. And there, I'll talk about them, but they're really a cool bee. Then you have the Russians, which were introduced into this country in the 90s um, to try to fix the uh, Varroa mite problem and some of the other things. Um, those bees are, are really hardy. And then you have the buckfast bees, which are historically have been around a long time. If you know anything about Buckfast Abbey and Brother Adam and Brother Columban, there's books about it, and you can go check that out on your own uh, on the internet. But there's a whole uh, interesting history of the buckfast bee. And so those are kind of the bees I'm going to just, I'm just going to cover them briefly. And then I'm going to give you uh, what, uh, what my opinion is and my favorites. And then we'll open it up to some questions. So we're going to try to cover these pretty quickly. This is not a scientific, you know, thing with all of that kind of science information. I'm just going to give you kind of a general, broad information about these kinds of bees for use as beekeeping. All right, so let's start with a picture. We have a picture of several different kinds of bees, and uh, in the top left screen there is a cordovan bee. As you can see, it's very light. It has that brown spot in the middle of its thorax, and that's kind of how you can tell a cordovan bee. Um, Cordovan bees make very, very light bees, and they're really pretty, and they're very docile. Probably the most docile bees I've ever had in my 10 years of beekeeping were the cordovans. Um, the middle picture uh, with that large black bee is the queen. These are all pictures of queens, by the way. 
because usually that's where you can tell you can tell the difference in the bee species by the queen. Um, not always. Sometimes they can trick you, even though they're a dark. They can be produced different kinds of bees. But that one in the center is a carniolan queen. And carnies can be black. They can be brown. They can have stripes. It can vary um, wildly, actually, depending on uh, who their mother was. Um, and the one on the right is a classic Italian honeybee, golden yellow. It's got a little bit of uh, fur on the sides of her uh, her abdomen there. And so those are just a couple of pictures. I didn't put a lot of pictures in this presentation because the pictures can be deceiving if you don't know a lot about the genetics. Really, more importantly, is the genetics of the bee, not necessarily what they look like, but these are just general pictures of what to look for um, when you're, you know, interested in different types of bees. All right. So Italian bees. Again, most popular, the ones you can most easily get anywhere in the United States or Canada. Um, the temperament, docile. Italians can be very docile bees. Um, they tend to be easy to work. They don't get excited a lot. Um, and remember, these are all generalizations because, you know, you can get an Italian beehive that's very testy. And so just as a general, you know, classification they are docile disease resistance is pretty good um, productivity is very good they're the, the bees that make the most honey out of all of these bees and they're overwintering overwintering capability if you live somewhere where I, like I do where it's chilly or snow or gets below zero um, kind of moderate uh, for for the Italians um, they can survive winter but, but one of the problems with the Italians is they eat a lot so they don't make a really, really tight cluster um, like the carnies and some of the other bees. So it's a little bit looser cluster. Um, and so when they're moving up, it's a little loose, and then they eat more because they're spread out more. It's one of the problems with uh, the Italians, and you have to leave them a lot more honey. So if, like for me, I'm in this business to make honey and to sell it. Not necessarily the best bee for me if I want to buy them make honey and then have them survive because I take a lot of the honey and then they might not survive, then I have to buy more bees. So it's kind of a balancing act. And then if I leave them a lot of honey, then, you know, I, I need that to, to make a living. So it's kind of, you know, it's catch 22, but they are probably the most popular bee uh, that you can get. And they're fantastic bees. There's no doubt about it. I like to get Italians. Um, so they make a lot of honey and, uh, they make large, large hives, um, you know, 60, 80,000 bees, large hive. All right, so that's Italian bees. Let's move on to carniolans. The carniolans are the, like I said, they can be a black, the queen can be black, she can be brown, she can be striped. Um, they can be pretty docile. They tend to be a little more aggressive than an Italian bee, but not always. But in my opinion, in my experience, they're a little more, a uh, little more aggressive. When you go inside the hive, you should use some smoke and, and uh, they're not as gentle as Italians usually. Disease res resistance is very good. Productivity is good, not as good as an Italian hive. They do not make as much honey. Um, but they do overwinter very well, so that's kind of their uh, that's kind of their benefit. They have a little bit better overwintering capability. That cluster that I was talking about, it's a tighter ball, and they don't eat as much honey, and they don't move as much. If you look at a really good carny hive and you open it in the winter, they're literally not moving. They're in, in a state of torpor, and that's a, that's a word they use for it's almost like a hibernation. Bees don't really hibernate, but they get in this state where they barely move. They don't eat a lot. They don't necessarily have to go to the bathroom. So they do that the best out of all of these bees. Some of the problems with carnies is they, uh, they tend to shut down when the honey flow stops. So if the nectar flow stops, they shut down immediately. So they don't keep going and just go through it like an Italian hive will just kind of go through it and forage for other things. Or they'll continue making brood. The carnies stop making brood, so the hive can kind of shrink. So that's kind of the downside. Um, positive is that they 
since the nectar and everything comes in so well in the spring, like in March in our part of the country or April, they really start strong. They, so they really come out of the hive and they make lots of bees early in the spring. So that is a benefit to the carnies. They, they tend to fly in a little bit cooler weather than Italians. They tend to go out when it's kind of like overcast and rainy sometimes. So that's a benefit. Italians, not so much. It has to be warm and pretty sunny for them to go out. Um, they'll look outside if it's 45 or 48 and cloudy. They say, nope, staying inside today. So, you know, if you live in that part of the world where it, the weather is not optimum, even in the summertime, then you kind of kind of take that into consideration. And that's what this is all about. Just kind of familiarizing yourself with these different bees and what they do. All right, so the Cordovan bees, again, these are not a separate uh, genetic um, type of a, a genetic type of uh, honeybee. They're like a subspecies of Italians that have a special gene that makes them very light, and basically they have no they have no pigment, so they have they're very light, honey colored. A lot, they have a lot of hair on them. And they're super docile. I would say that out of the hundreds and hundreds of hives that I've had over the last 10 years, these were the bees that were the most gentle. I could open the lid without smoking them. I could do, even on a cloudy day when they're not necessarily happy that you're in there, they never were aggressive at all. Um, they were amazing, amazing bees. Um, disease resistance, again, good, similar to Italians. You know, they're they're very much like Italians. Productivity, very good again because they're Italian bee. They bring in lots of honey. They make very, very large um, nests. And the overwintering is, again, it's moderate um, to not great because of the size of the hive and how much honey they eat and that whole thing. So these, uh, I think I had these bees for only two years, and then they, then they didn't make it on that third year because they just, you know, they eat a lot of honey, and maybe I didn't leave them enough, or maybe they had my, there's a lot of reasons, that, but they just, I just couldn't keep them propagating like I could some of the other strains of bees. I try to have four or five different kinds of bees in my apiaries at any one time so that, um, you know, they, they mix. Uh, and it's when they, when they mate, so they mix, and then you get kind of a, a mutt bee, which is what I'll talk about in a little bit, which is really what we have the most of in the United States. We don't have these pure defined breeds that we're talking about here as much. I mean, you get a little bit of it, but all right. So the Russian group, Russian bees, again, they were brought into this country in the nineties. They tend to be a darker bee. They're a little bit nervous. If you pull out a frame of them and you tip it back and forth to inspect it, they kind of run. They run to one side and they run to the other side. Um, one of their benefits is that their disease resistance is really good. It's very good. Productivity is just kind of average. They're not as good as Italians. It's probably about the same as Carnies. But their overwintering ability is very good because they, again, have that tight cluster. Um, they're from a place in Russia where it was very chilly, and so they're genetic makeup allows them to survive in a colder environment. So that's kind of, you know, why they brought them into this country and uh, started um, the, I guess it would be the USDA was trying to do some uh, genetic stuff with the Russian bees. I'm not uh, exactly sure what was going on with that. And then there's the Buckfest bees. Like I said, um, I do not know if you can still get these. I think there's a couple of places in Texas that still supposedly sell a strain of Buckfast bees. I have never had any, so I'm not an expert. I'm just going to tell you what I've read. Um, their temperament is medium. Um, they can be angry bees if you let them breed their own queens several generations um, down two or three generations they can get very angry so a lot of people that use buckfast bees will buy the queens over and over every year so that the bees don't get a little testy their disease resistance is good um, their productivity is very good and their overwintering is also very good so that's another reason that people want to uh you know these bees have been around a long time like i said um check out you know look up buckfast abbey or brother adam brother columban there's a couple of books out there about uh how he produced his bees and how he overwintered nukes and all kinds of stuff. So 
pretty interesting. Uh, B, it's been around a long time. And uh, those are kind of the types of bees. All right, so I know that was a lot of information and a you know, short condensed thing. And like I said, I didn't go into a whole scientific thing about the genetics and all that. There's plenty of information out there on the internet about that. Um, I'm just looking at it from the perspective of a, of a beekeeper. Somebody wants to buy bees and start um, some hives. And so, of course, my favorite bee is going to be the Italian because it's gentle. It makes a lot of honey. It's um, mostly available just about anywhere. Um, but like I said, since I live in the north, it's hard to overwinter the Italians. So, you know, there was, in the old days, there were, there were beekeepers that would just, you know, get a ton of Italian bees, make a lot of honey, take the honey and sell it, and then the bees would just die in the winter, and then they would start all over again. Um, but nowadays, that is not a good idea because bees are a lot more expensive than they used to be. You know, you used to be able to buy a package of bees for 10 or $20. Now they're 130, so big difference because of all the diseases and all the things that are happening to the bee population. So if you just have pure Italians, it's a little bit harder to overwinter. So what I like is a Carney Italian cross, and there's a lot of um, a lot of bee breeders out there making this Carney Italian cross. So they take the traits of the Italian, which are the making a lot of honey, building up. And then they take the carney and cross its genetics so it has a little bit better overwintering capability, a smaller cluster. And so, you know, the best of both worlds. And so those tend to be, uh, in my opinion, the best queens. Hello, Julie. Those tend to be the best queens that you can, uh, you can get. And when you're looking at them, uh, they kind of look like tigers. They have like a, a light abdomen like that Italian I showed you, but they have a dark stripe every so often on their abdomen so that I call them tigers and they they tend to have been my best um, producing queens and my best overwintering queens and uh, those those are my favorites the Italian carne cross but again you know what's my third favorite bees that are alive in the spring <laughs> you know it doesn't really matter what their breed was if you know I put them in the box they made me some honey and they survived until the next spring, um, they must be a pretty good bee. And so that's kind of what this whole talk has been about. I told you all about those different kinds of bees, but in reality, if you're just starting out, you're not going to have enough knowledge or enough experience to even see those little differences in, in what I was telling you about. Those things are are figured out by experienced beekeepers that have been doing this a long time, have studied them, have had hundreds and hundreds of hives, and they can differentiate those little differences. So as a new beekeeper, if you're just buying bees, whether you get Italians or carnies or crosses, you're not gonna you're not gonna understand the differences yet. So it doesn't really matter. My advice is just to get some bees and start. Get your equipment, get set up. And then as time goes on over the years, you will understand the differences um, between the bees. Um, and so, and here's the reason I say this. Um, I'm going to put up a little chart here. Don't get panicky. It's not going to be math class yet. But this is a, <clears throat> a standard deviation chart. You've probably seen this if you had, uh, if you were, teacher and you did grades for kids or there's if you made vehicles or made any kind of manufacturing device this is the way they figure out you know how things are good bad and, and not acceptable and they fall in different ranges and so in my experience if you buy 10 queens and you put them in hives and you feed them and you do everything equal you treat them you do everything the same they're in the same part of the apiary this is what happens you get two queens that fall into the amazing category. They're just like, they're the best producing queens. They produce bees that are very, very docile and everything's great. And then you get six queens that are kind of in the middle. You get three on the side that are pretty good and three on the side that are just, they're okay. They're average. They're, you just get six queens that do okay. And then you'll get two that just don't do anything. Either they make a small cluster, they don't really make honey that year. You know, they survive but they're not flourishing or 
they do pretty well and then they start laying just as a drone layer so then that queen fails or they both fail so that's kind of what happens if you have 10 queens unless you get really unlucky and then you know but on average that's what's going to happen that's why it's called excuse me the standard deviation so if you're a beekeeper and you're just starting and you buy one package where is your one package going to land you don't know so that's the thing. If you're just starting and you just have one or two packages or one or two nukes, you, you don't know where they're going to fall as far as the queens. Even if you know the genetics, you can't. You don't make a decision based on that. Don't let it, you know, keep you from getting bees just because, oh, I wanted this certain type and they're all sold out or whatever. Don't let that be the thing that stops you from starting to be a beekeeper because it really isn't that important. The honeybees are so closely related all the different types they're all going to do fine if you uh if you just stop and get some um so here's the truth the best bees that you should get are local overwintered bees so if wherever you're at in the world get some bees that have survived even if you don't live in a place where there's an actual winter just get some bees that have survived you know one to two years and that queen has survived and then she's going to be a great queen for you. So if you're going to buy nukes, look at that video that I did last week on nukes and packages and learn all about the differences. But if you're going to do nukes, get try to get local overwintered bees, pay more for them. You'll, uh, you'll be happy that you did that. And if you just want to get packages, then you're probably going to just end up with Italians anyway, because it's really one of the most popular bees that you can get. And Italians are fantastic bees. I, you know, I usually get a lot of Italians. And then if I, sometimes I requeen them to, to the carnies or the carny crosses so that I have a better overwintering average, but not always. Um, sometimes I just take my chances and they don't all die over the winter. It's just that they have a higher percentage because they eat more honey. But the real truth is that no matter what bee you get, they probably aren't going to survive the first year anyway. I didn't even put that in writing because I didn't want a bunch of people to be sad. But the reality is that when you first start out, the odds of you being able to do all of this and get everything and have them survive the first year, very low, very low odds. I did it by accident. I had one hive. I bought a package. Um, I got it from Georgia. I put it in the box. It was doing really well. And then it swarmed. And I didn't even know that was my bees that swarmed. And the neighbors called me and said, hey, I have some bees in my bush. <laughs> so me and my wife ran over there. And I was all excited that I had caught my first swarm. And I was like, what are the odds? I just started becoming a beekeeper. And I caught this swarm of bees right across the street. <laughs> well, I had marked my queen. And so when I got this swarm, my wife actually reached into the bush and chopped it. And I put, I had a bee suit on it. She didn't have any equipment on. And we put this in a box and then I looked at it later and found out that it was my queen and my bees that had swarmed into the neighbor's yard. So then I was, I ended up with two hives. And uh, I believe that both of those hives survived. Very, very lucky. Um, and I don't, I'm not even know why because then the next year when I got some more nukes and some other things and bees started dying from mites and other things so um, don't worry about necessarily the type of bees that you're going to get um, I just wanted to do this as an introduction to the different species of honeybees so that you can get an idea of the differences but any bees that you can get um, the best bees would be free bees if you could capture a swarm for free you know those are going to be your best bees but that's harder to do these days so I would say that uh, that's kind of the gist of it. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer your questions about uh, any of the bee stuff that we have covered. Um, if you don't have any questions, if you have a question later, you can go back to this video and ask it, and I will come back and comment on it um, when I put it up as a, as a permanent video. If you've got value out of this, please like it uh, so that uh, other people will think that it's worth watching because uh, these do take some time to put together. Um, do we have any questions? I guess we don't have any questions. Well, I'd like to thank you for watching uh, this little uh, introduction into the different kinds of bees. Um, Subscribe if you'd like to be a better beekeeper. 
And until next time, uh, be extraordinary and we'll talk soon.